Think Forward. Think Research Channel. The opinions expressed in the following program are strictly those of the speaker. They do not necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation. From the National Science Foundation, where discoveries begin, this is Frontier, discussions of today's most exciting research subjects by distinguished scientists and engineers working at the frontiers of knowledge. So thank you uh, very much for having me and thank you for inviting me and uh, for the introduction. Um, so as David uh, indicated, I'm going to um, talk to you a little bit about some work that I've been involved in for um, a number of years now um, on scaling phenomena uh, in biology. It was a work that, um, uh, that I began when I was still very heavily involved in the high energy physics, which is where I've spent most of my career. Um, and uh, it was partly stimulated as a reaction to the uh, terrible demise of the SSC, the Superconducting Supercollider, which I was somewhat involved with at the time. And it was sort of some funny reaction of getting involved in something completely different. Um, and uh, it, it was stimulated because um, the scaling laws, as I will show you if you're not familiar, are quite remarkable. And the work uh, was uh, eventually grew into a very powerful and intense and extraordinarily enjoyable collaboration uh, with biologists, which continues to today and is broader than the original group. But the work also evolved itself from understanding these extraordinary scaling laws to a much more challenging, deep, and profound set of questions, which are due to do with uh, the questions implicit in the title, namely, to what extent can um, the biological and the social sciences be put into a conceptual framework based on fundamental principles that can be mathematized, <laughs> made quantitative, and therefore predictive? So uh, to what extent can that be done um, or can it be done at all? And we already know there are examples where it has been done, um, but um, in a very, very limited way. The question here was, you know, is there sort of a bigger picture view of this? Um, and uh, uh, I will talk a little bit about that as I go along, but I want to say at the beginning, if you put that in a sort of physical science framework, well, the framework initiated by Galileo, in fact, um, that uh, there are underlying precise laws of nature from which we can calculate any phenomenon to any degree of accuracy, as is the case in physics. Um, the answer in terms of the biological and sociological sciences is clearly no. There is never going to be such a theory. There's not a theory where we can calculate any phenomenon, at least in principle, whether in practice or not, is, remains, would remain an open question. But even in principle, we can't. And that goes to the very heart of biological and social phenomena that distinguishes it from the realm, the very narrow realm defined by physics. And that is the difference between simplicity and complexity. We know that when you have a system of so many interacting parts, where there are so many different levels of interaction, so many different scales of interaction, where there are new emergent phenomena either strongly or weakly connected with other parts of the system, um, that th these kinds of phenomena are often also contingent upon historical accidents and spe specific cases are sensitive to initial conditions and so on, leading to a situation where you cannot, uh, you cannot expect to have a precise theory. So having said all that, having said that uh, we can never expect a sort of Newton's laws of biology, we can still ask the question, is there some context in which the social and biological sciences could be put in a mathematical, quantitative, predictive framework? And I think the answer there is, is and I would try to convince you, 
is yes to some extent in this work I look at now as scratching the surface in answering this question, very much scratching the surface, beginning a process. And, uh, the, and I think the, the, the way of thinking about that is that yes, in the context of what I will refer to as coarse-grained behavior. So it wouldn't be understanding precise, having, getting precise answers to specific questions, but it would be getting generic quantitative predictive answers to generic questions. So the example I like to give, because it is the example which got me into all of this, uh, and that's the question of aging and death. And so I can already make a quantitative, a, a, a predictive statement that is quantitative, which is exact, I think, about everybody in this room, which is biological, and that is you'll all be dead in 100 years. And that is not a facetious statement, that is a serious statement because the real question is not only understanding the mechanism of aging and mortality, but being able to understand why it is if you're a human being, if you're a mammal of this size, you are not going to live for much more than 100 years as an order of magnitude and to understand where in the hell that number of 100 years comes from because we believe that all biology ultimately is to do with the behavior of molecules, whether they be genes or respiratory complexes or whatever. And um, where in those molecular scales sits 100 years if you're a human being, but if this very same tissue happened to have been a mouse, it would have been dead, in my case, 65 years ago. So we need to understand that. That's the point. And we need to have a theory that can predict that. So a theory of aging is not just a bunch of mechanisms, lengthening, shortening telomeres, or, or whatever. It's that doing that will predict not only how much you change, but, but the length of the, if it ha that happened to be the explanation of aging, the length of the telomere, you would do a calculation, and it would say, if you're a human being, I'm afraid 100 years is your lot. And you would understand where that came from, from the molecular structure. So the question is, what parts of the social sciences and biological sciences for some of the bigger questions do we only need to know some of the coarse grain features? That's what this work is really about. So what I'm going to do, having said that, is uh, start out by going back to this question of understanding these scaling uh, questions. So here's the point. The point is that life is almost certainly the most complex, diverse, and I would even contend the most interesting physical system in the universe, including probably the universe itself at some level, amazingly. And um, yet, and so the, and we all know the physics and chemistry involved in it is extraordinary. Um, and uh, yet, it satisfies some extraordinary simple scaling laws. So I'm going to introduce this. This is, so first, showing you something to illustrate the diversity. This is called the metabolic chart. This is just the roadmap of the various chemicals that participate in producing ATP, your currency of energy. And that is, a, and as I say, that's, that's a highly simplified version, but it's obviously a highly complex network. And here's another highly complex system. That's a forest, and it contains creatures and uh, organisms of extraordinary different range of sizes and an extraordinary interaction of multiple components. And uh, the question is, can we understand that coarse-grained behavior of that? So for example, can we understand in the framework of the way I, what I was presenting, the sort of philosophy, can we look at this picture and have a formula that tells me how tall this tree actually is, if I could look at the whole thing? How much energy is flowing in it, how much fluid, um, how many plants are there of this size, how far does this man have to walk to find a tree of this size, how many leaves are on this branch, et cetera, et cetera. Everything about that in a coarse grain description. And understand the underlying principles and dynamics that are functioning to produce that and at the same time have those principles at work in the one explicit mammal that we see here. So that's the kind of picture. Okay, so 
Given this extraordinary complexity and diversity, it is surprising that if you plot one of the most fundamental quantities in biology versus size, and this was done many, many years ago, uh, his metabolic rate, how much energy per unit time you need to stay alive, versus body mass on a log-log scale, you get it a straight line. You get a very simple power law, and here it is here, down the bottom here. So it has a power law. It's a straight line on a log-log plot, and it has a very simple slope, very close to 3 quarters. And the first point I want to emphasize, forget about the slope. This is already remarkable if you believe in natural selection, because each one of these organisms and each subsystem of those organisms and each subsystem of those, each cell, each cell type, has evolved in its own unique environmental niche over geologic time. Somehow, despite that, all of these things have lined up to be on the same, on the same curve, um, and they all represent an ex uh, one of the most complex processes uh, that exists in the universe. And there has this extraordinary simplicity. So there is an extraordinary simplicity being represented here, which says that as far as metabolism is concerned, an elephant is a blown up gorilla, which is a blown up kangaroo, which is a blown up human being, which is a blown up mouse. We're all basically the same as far as metabolism is concerned. So um, this is interesting of itself, but it's even more interesting because it's true of every taxonomic group, I have, including plants. Uh, here's some ancient data again, and here's what we saw before. These are cold-blooded, and these are uh, bacteria, basically. Uh, with my collaborators, we took this down even into intracellular levels. This is, these are modern data on unicells, the green. And what's put on here is a point for a decoupled and in vitro mammalian cell, mitochondrion, and respiratory complex. These are just the molecules that produce ATP. And uh, what we drew in there actually was a line of exactly three-quarter slope. And this scaling law goes from mo molecules all the way up to um, the blue whale, so covering 27 orders of magnitude. So that's interesting. Um, but maybe even more interesting is that if you look at any physiological variable, whether it be uh, something mundane, which I will show you a couple examples of, to something profound like lifespan, um, or uh, you look at detailed f phenomena like diffusion rates across various membranes and so on. Maybe a hundred of these I could show you that have a similar kind of behavior, representing an extraordinary spectrum of biological phenomena. Um, and they all have the same kind of behavior. They are closely approximated by power laws of this type. Uh, but, and most importantly, they are ones with, whose exponents are typically multiples of one quarter. Here's genome length for, vari uh, for various cells. This is the, the total number of base pairs versus uh, mass for a bunch of cells. And there's a lot of variation, but the best fit is very close to one quarter. Um, heart rate decreases as mass to the one quarter. And indeed, almost all rates decrease as mass to the one quarter. So heart rate decreases as mass to the one quarter. Therefore, if you multiply the two together, you get the total number of heartbeats in a lifespan, and it's an invariant, roughly, an approximate invariant, about one and a half billion. And uh, if you knew this number, this is a, obviously a fundamental number of mammalian biology because it determines uh, how long everybody's going to live. And that's the number you've got to calculate if you really want to understand the biology of aging. Now, there's nothing fundamental about hearts. It's a, uh, it happens to be a particular engineered system that's evolved. But there is something fundamental about the production of ATP. And the real invariant here, and I've written it here in blue, is the number of times the reaction takes place in the respiratory complex producing ATP. 
And that is an invariant that is true across aerobic metabolism, which constitutes a significant part of organic life. So uh, what we learned from this is that uh, there is this extraordinary simplicity, despite the extraordinary complexity of the phenomena, in the way these things scale. Furthermore, um, there's a universality represented by this number four. Four plays some magic role in, across all of biology. Um, built into it is the idea of, of, of greater efficiency with size. And uh, you can see that by simply recognizing that if metabolic rate increases as mass to the three quarters, the metabolic rate per unit mass decreases as mass to the one quarter. But the metabolic rate per unit mass can be identified as proportional to the metabolic rate of the average cell, because the number of cells, roughly speaking, increases linearly. So the metabolic rate per unit mass decreases as mass to the one quarter. And so there's this efficiency of size. And it's sort of a, a interesting, because the liver cell of a shrew is the same, basically, as the liver cell of a whale. Yet somehow, the metabolic rate of that average liver cell is decreasing with size in a systematic way. And in fact, uh, you, can ask, you can determine from this that a, uh, a gram of mouse tissue needs three times, I've written down here, three times the power of a dog um, and nine times that of an elephant, uh, illustrating the greater efficiency with size. And indeed, if you took all of your 10 to the 14th cells and cultivated them in a dish, instead of requiring only 100 watts, which surprisingly is all each of us takes to stay alive, a light bulb, we're each a light bulb, um, which is another incident, incidentally statement of the extraordinary efficiency, absolute efficiency that we have. But um, if you uh, cultivated all the 10 to the 14th cells, um, we would require sort of 100 watts, 10,000 watts. So there's a tremendous efficiency of size. Now, um, uh, what I'm now going to talk about is the work that I got into trying to understand, explain these scaling laws. And our, uh, with my biology colleagues, as, as David mentioned, James Brown, distinguished ecologist, and Brian Enquist, who, when we began this, was still a student, is now himself a, an established, young, distinguished researcher. Um, so here's the idea that we, um, we proposed. And that was that, first of all, is to recognize that these are not accidents. So here's what we proposed. We said that, OK, look, what is the problem of any complex system, in particular an organism, has to face? Well, one of the major problems is you have to make sure, if you're made up of 10 to the 14th cells, for example, um, that each one of those is, roughly speaking, sustained in a, an efficient, roughly democratic fashion. Obviously, there's difference between organs and so on. But on the average, you have to make sure that everybody is, all your customers are being satisfied. And natural selection in evolving multicellularity, but even before that, solved the problem by evolving hierarchical branching network systems in order to take macroscopic quantities and deliver them to local sites, to those local customers, so to speak, and um, uh, service them in one way or another. So the first thing that we postulated was life at all scales, whether it's intracellularly um, or ecologically or at an ecosystem level, is sustained by hierarchical branching networks. And so this worldview would be that when you think of an organism such as us, all we are from that viewpoint is a circuitry, respiratory, renal, neural system, a system of bones, and so on. That's who we are. And the rest is, is superficial. But that would be true even at the intracellular level. So, um, so we postulate that as a beginning. That's what dominates the structure of organisms. 
And the, these scaling laws are simply a reflection of the universal properties, the universal mathematical, topological, geometric properties of these networks. But, and these properties have to be independent of the explicit design that evolved, whether it be a mammal, a tree, or a, an insect. So uh, here's what we proposed. The first was that the first property was that these networks have to be space filling. They have to go everywhere. So you have to put that into some mathematical language, and I'm not, I will talk about it very briefly in a moment. So the first has to be space filling. The second is that the terminal unit of the network, the capillaries, the mitochondrion within cells, uh, the petiole of a tree, and so on, all of these terminal units are within that design invariant, meaning that uh, the capillary of a whale is, at the, is not distinguishable relative to the eight orders of magnitude that you scale down to a shrew from the capillary of a shrew. Okay? And these ideas can be thought of as derivative of natural selection in the sense that natural selection in, in creating new species, in evolving new species, did not reinvent the fundamental units. It built up from the fundamental units, whether they be cells or capillaries or whatever. The fundamental units remain the same. It is simply a changing of the scale and indeed the changing of the network. In much the same way that uh, this is a very large building relative to the houses you live in, but uh, the outlets, the terminal units of all the networks in this building are exactly the same as they are in your house. And in fact, they're exactly the same as they are if you lived in Bangladesh or if you lived in Sydney, Australia. They may look slightly different, but they're all roughly the, the electrical outlets are the same all the world over. Uh, the water faucets are the same all the way, world over, even though the size and design of the buildings are quite different. So that's the idea. The last of the sort of principles that we enunciated was the most um, uh, powerful, but also maybe the strongest, and that is that um, of the infinitude of possible networks that could have evolved, that are space-filling and have invariant terminal units, the ones that have actually evolved and the ones that are manifested in real life organisms are ones that have in some way have optimized the system. It's a very strong statement. That is, so for example, of the infinitude of networks that all of us share as circuitry systems, and by us, I don't mean everybody in this room only, or everybody, every human being, I mean every mammal that all of us share, the, uh, if you, this, this statement is simply that if I make any variation on that network, if I double the length of the third artery, your heart has to work harder. Or if I halve its length, I have to work harder. Well, that's a fantastic principle if, you, if you're a physicist, because it means that you can write down an equation of motion, and you can write down a field theory for this network and solve the complete dynamics of the network. And that's what this work did. So what this did is it took those ideas and it put them into a mathematical structure that could be applied to, in principle, any network, solve it in its entirety, and then from that ask the question, what happens now for a given network if I change the size of the, 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 net, the, the body that it's feeding? And what you get out of that are all these quarter power scaling laws. So, for example, um, if you wanted to know, perversely, what the radius, length, blood flow rate, pulse rate was in the ninth branch of a hippopotamus, there is a formula here that you can put in the numbers, and you will find that it gives the right answer for all those quantities for the, so to speak, average hippopotamus. Okay, so when I started this work, actually I started it on, uh, on my own, if I knew then what I know now about biology, there is no way I would have worked on this. I would have thought this was impossible. Luckily, for me, I was ignorant and arrogant, and uh, that meant that I zoomed ahead 
So here's what I did. I looked at cartoons of circuitry systems in physiology books. Uh, I looked at pieces of meat first, and then I looked at this. And then I realized that needs to be made real, so I did that. Made it sort of what I, what I think of as the engineer's view. And then I did the physicist view. This goes to what we were saying in terms of the philosophy of this. The physicist view. Just a simple branching tree network. Uh, and I've made it so simple, I've made it just bifurcate. You could make this, you know, make the branching ratio anything you like, actually. But here's the simplest possible thing. And the question is, let's analyze this. Let's see what we can learn from this. So it's very much this idea of trying to understand the average idealized network and therefore the functioning of an average idealized organism. And a priori, there's been no reason for doing this. Why do you do it? Because the data has told us. All that scaling data says there's only one mammal, and everything else is a variant, roughly speaking of it. Everything else is a variant, and the interesting biology is getting rid of the average idealized part and looking at the variations. But let's first understand the gross idealized part. That's what the data is telling us. What is it telling us? So what you immediately have is the flow rate in the aorta is the number of capillaries times the flow rate in an average capillary. And the flow rate in the aorta is the metabolic rate up to a constant because blood carries oxygen. That's the whole point of blood and delivers it to the cells. And the concentration of oxygen is an invariant, basically, uh, across for all blood of all mammals. So, and indeed, metabolic rate is actually measured simply by, uh, not in blood, but it's measured by the, the respiration, by oxygen you consume. So, I want to do one thing immediately. Um, if this is an invariant, then as scales metabolic rate, so scales the number of capillaries. So if metabolic rate scales as mass to the three quarters, which I claim we have proven, but uh, maybe I'll, I'll say a few more words about it, then the number of capillaries has to scale as mass to the three quarters. So this theory would also predict, as the data confirms, the number of capillaries scales as mass to the three quarters. Why is that interesting? That's interesting because the number of cells that it feeds scales linearly. So that's another statement of the greater efficiency with size. The bigger you are, the more cells per capillary are being fed. And it has extraordinary consequences. And that is because of this mismatch. That is the reason you stop growing. But that is what happens is the number of sources is scaling slower than the number of sinks. So eventually, you can't keep up with it, and you stop growing. And I will formalize that in a little while. So the way this whole calculation goes, as I said before, is um, basically the idea is the scaling that we observed, that allometric, so-called allometric scaling across sizes, is actually a window onto the underlying dynamics. And that underlying dynamics is encoded in the generic dynamics of networks. And so the calculation that I outlined is really understanding how I just idealized a tube here. How does a tube scale as you go down through the network? And then that gets translated into, um, into the scaling with size. So here's the basic ideas. The space filling idea actually constrains the way length scale when you mathematize it. And this is a statement, basically, that um, every, let's talk about the, the, the circuitry system. Every capillary has to end up feeding a group of cells. That's, that's a biological statement of space filling. The, to mathematize it, you have to think of looking at different scales of this. So you imagine um, uh, looking at a resolution where you can't see the capillary, you only see the next level. The resolution is good enough to see a capillary, you see the next level. But that next level, the network, which is now um, a slightly fuzzy network, still has to feel and, and uh, span the whole space. 
So you have to, ex you keep expressing that as you change the resolution, as you look at the network, and what that leads to is this statement, which relates the uh, length of a, of a vessel at the k plus one level to the level of the k. If you optimize the system by minimizing the amount of energy the heart has to do in the circuitry system case, then you can determine the way radii scale. And the way this works is the following. When heart is pumped out of your, uh, out of your heart through the aorta, the wave that comes down is, roughly speaking, sinusoidal, and there's no dissipation. Viscosity plays almost no role. Uh, it reaches some bifurcation point. Some goes down one, some down another tube. And of course, if it's an arbitrary network, some bounces back. So the equations tell you, not surprisingly, that you better not have any bouncing back. You better not be fighting yourself, so you better match impedances. So you end up um, being, having evolved just like the grid system that sends electricity across the country. You impedance match, and what the impedance matches is for a large animal, for the large part of the system, is this statement that the ratio of levels of radii goes like 1 over the square root of 2 in any dimension, it turns out. And um, that is basically a statement of impedance matching. Now tubes get smaller and smaller and smaller. Viscosity comes more and more into play. Energy is dissipated. And you have to solve then the equations that minimize, that minimize reflections and at the same time minimize energy dissipation. And uh, it is from that that you learn about the way radii scale as you go down through the system. It is dominated by this um, for large vessels, for most of where your blood is. And indeed, when you put this together with this, coupled with the other statement, the other result prediction that comes out of solving the equations, a very simple result that the volume of the network, therefore the volume of blood, is linear in the total mass of the system, which is indeed true uh, from the data, then if you couple all these together, you get this mass of the three quarters. You see this statement is extremely important because it relates mammals of different size or organisms of different size. The theory then tells you this is the result for large mammals, and the theory then allows you to determine predictions, uh, deviations from it, and the most salient being, obviously, if you think about it, the smaller the mammal, the the, the number of vessels that can sustain a pulse and not be subject to viscosity gets smaller and smaller. You could imagine an extreme state where an animal is so small that its aorta can, is, is so narrow that it can no longer support a pulse, so that every tube in that system is dissipating energy. So it's the system, so to speak, goes through, in fact, does go through a phase transition if you look in size space. And uh, that's a complete change to us. We dissipate almost no energy until we get down to the bottom part of the system. It's a total engineering system. It's a beautifully engineered system that we have evolved. Um, but this calculation allows you to calculate the size of the smallest animal, smallest mammal, because um, it's totally inefficient if you have a system that dissipates in all vessels, whereas a system like us, which only dissipates in a small number, and indeed, if you calculate the metabolic rate, it changes from a three-quarters power smoothly to a linear power, which means there is no gain of efficiency with size, and you can then speculate that this, you can then calculate what the smallest mammal is, that can, because it's that which can sustain a pulse in at least a couple of the branches. And if you put the numbers in, you get a number of the order of a gram, which is the mass of a, uh, a shrew. You can do a similar calculation, incidentally, to calculate the maximum size, which is to do with this fact that the branching is opening up because the number of capillaries is scaling less than linearly. So the average distance between them is getting bigger and bigger. And obviously, if it gets too big, you can't diffuse oxygen and resources to the cells in between. And you can do that calculation. And guess what? You find that the size of the biggest mammal can, cannot be much bigger than 10 to the 8th times the smallest. And a, and a whale is 
roughly speaking, 10 to the 8th bigger than a, a, a shrew. So um, that's a, a nice uh, confirming kind of calculation. Anyway, I'm not going to, I'm going to, there's a whole bunch of, there's, this, there's a million things that we've compared it to. This is for the circulatory system that I talked about. And similarly with trees and plants and so on, I don't have time to go through. And indeed, the questions that I asked about that picture of a forest. How much, how many leaves does a particular branch have? How far do you have to walk to find a tree of a given size? What is the distribution of plants of a given size? Uh, how much energy is flowing in a given branch of a given tree? We've worked all that out. You can see all sorts of things here, branch resistance, leaf specific conductivity, and so on and so forth. So there are two major take home messages here. There's the quarter power, but there's this greater efficiency with size. And where it comes from in the theory is that if you calculate the hydrodynamic resistance of the whole network, it decreases with size as mass to the three quarters. That is, the number of outlets is increasing much faster than the added resistance of each outlet. So the resistance is decreasing, sort of predicts, and it agrees with the data. But the, the, the volume flow rate, which is the current, the amperage, is increasing as mass of the three quarters. So if you multiply them together, you get the voltage, the blood pressure. So it predicts that blood pressure is an invariant, which is sort of a surprising prediction, because your aorta is this big, a whale's is this big, and a shrew is a fraction of a millimeter. And this says that uh, their blood pressure, and indeed the, um, the velocity of flow, should be invariant. And indeed, they are. The two things I want to talk about first is the following, is that one of the major interesting predictions of this is, or is that the network plays a dominant role in the, in the organization of this, and that in particular, it is the hegemony of the network that is controlling the cell. OK, so if I. I said the cell, and in fact, the data is saying, and the theory predicts, that the metabolic rate in vivo decreases as mass to the, uh, actually, I redrew it here, is decreasing as mass to the one quarter. But if I remove the network uh, by cultivating a cell in vitro, then it says they wouldn't be on this line. They'd all be the same. They'd no longer be controlled by the network. So a prediction of the theory is that if I plot metabolic rate versus mass, then um, I should get a straight line, an invariant quantity in vitro for the same cells that were scaling as mass to one quarter in vivo. And this is a quantitative theory, so it tells you all the numbers here. So um, here's the data that we published. It's pretty good. OK, so I'm going to now switch, um, and I'm going to introduce cities by talking about growth, because growth and social organizations and economics are intimately related. And I want to talk very briefly about growth, because here's growth, a typical growth curve, sigmoidal, sigmoidal growth curve, and it's a scaling phenomenon. And the question is, can we understand that? And the answer is yes, because in this theory, you have a network. It feeds the cells. The, the oxygen feeds the cells. But so, what, does that, what does that do, that oxygen? Well, it maintains the cells that are already there and replaces ones that have died. And then it adds new biomass by creating new cells. So you can write down. This is the only technical thing I'm going to do, really. You can write down a very, this is a very simplified version. But here it is. What happens, metabolic rate can either maintain the number of cells times the metabolic rate of each cell, or it can add new ones. This is the energy needed to create a cell, and this is the rate at which you're doing it. OK, so I'm going to go quickly through this. This can be put into a growth equation, because the number of cells is just the total mass divided by the average mass of a cell. And if you put that together, you end up with a very simple equation for growth, which is a universal growth equation, because the parameters in it are all determined by fundamental parameters of biology, the overall scale of metabolism, the average mass of a cell, the average energy needed to create a cell, et cetera, et cetera. And indeed, if you do that, you can easily solve the equation. 
and there's a bunch of data for fish, birds, and mammals, and a small sampling. And those are absolute predictions for those data. Those are from the theory because we have an absolute. And to make that very clear, you can rescale the solution to that equation and uh, plot it this way. You plot this variable, the mass at age t relative to mature mass raised to the quarter power versus this Byzantine variable. A is a constant given by the theory in terms of these fundamental biological quantities. T is age, M is the asymptotic mass, natural log, birth mass. What the theory says is that no matter who you are, with the one caveat that you mustn't be a plant for this, because plant has a lot of dead wood, everybody grows in the same way when plotted this way. So this is data of mammals, fish, birds, crustacea, insects, and so on. And you can see it's pretty good. And uh, you don't have to believe any of the theory. It's a beautiful and spiritual way of seeing the unity of life. And uh, there it is. But the theory actually predicts this and predicts what this curve should be. Now, cities. Just to show you, this was the original, this is the collaboration. And it isn't really, this is an interesting example where it was started with me and these people. And uh, it then evolved into me and these people. These are all young. These are all young, vigorous people, unlike this lot and me. <laughs> Uh, and it ended up being this lot, really. But what I want you to notice is the, there's, a, there's an interesting, interesting bunch of backgrounds here. And for two years, we did nothing. We, we accomplished nothing. We met. We talked about complexity in cities and corporations and economics and finance. And we made no progress. First of all, I couldn't understand what most of them were talking about. And they sure as hell couldn't understand me. And so, and so it went, and it was terrible. And then in the third year, which of course is the last year of the project, somewhere in the middle of that, boom, something happened. And, and this little group, especially these two and myself, but also the, it actually started, no, it started with all of us. Um, something happened, as it does. But one of the things I have learned in my 66 years is that nothing, it must be Shakespeare somewhere, nothing goes for nothing. Everything eventually contributes and everything somehow, all the rubbish that we did eventually got incorporated in a productive way and I'd like to spend the last few minutes telling you about it. So the, this was, the natural idea was, so having done this work on, in biology and covered an extraordinary spectrum of phenomena in biology, an extraordinary scale in biology, it was very natural to think about social organizations. And we first thought about corporations, but we couldn't get the data we wanted. We turned to cities, and largely because one of the collaborators, two of the collaborators knew a hell of a lot about cities, major players in, in urban dynamics and so on. And um, uh, we uh, started to think about this, and uh, the, the, the problem in the end became the way I like to think about it is to what, to what extent, if any, is a city just an extension of biology? That is, is Washington just a great big organism? Or is there something different about Washington and as a city and its interface with uh, everything else that goes on in the world that distinguishes it from a great big elephant or a great big tree since Washington doesn't move? Um, so that was sort of the, uh, some of the ideas behind uh, thinking about this. And the first thing was just turn the crank. Ask, first of all, are there power laws? Meaning, is Washington just a scaled-down New York City and a blown-up Santa Fe? Or is that complete rub? You know, you can check that by looking at every possible variable you could think of about a city and plotting it versus its size. And if it falls in a log log plot, if it falls, roughly speaking, on a straight line, then you damn well know that in some sense, Washington is in fact, even though it has no adobe buildings in it whatsoever, is just a blown up Santa Fe, as strange as that may be. And of course, if that's true, when you think about it, maybe it isn't so surprising, because what constitutes a city? What dominates a city? 
people, roads, commerce, thinking, universities, all of these things, and they're everywhere. And the fact that things look different should not obscure the idea that there's a unified dynamic in the same way that a giraffe does not really look much like a gorilla. But in fact, you know, on the scale of which we're talking, they're basically scaled versions of one another. Of course, they have their own specific environmental niches, and they do specific things that are true biology and one needs to focus on, but one first wants to get this big picture. The question is, is there such a thing for cities? So the first thing we looked at were what we called infrastructure, and I'm just going to give you a very quick survey. Gasoline stations, length of roads, uh, electrical cables, and here's the exponent beta. And you can see the beta is very, is, is very similar across all these, around 0.8. Um, but it's less than one. This is important. It's less than one, which means that there is an efficiency of size, efficiency of scale. That is, you need less roads per capita, less gasoline, gasoline stations per capita as you increase. Just what you might expect, just like biology, just like organisms. Then there's a bunch of trivial things, which we think of as basic individual needs. If you ask the number of houses, the number of jobs, well, that's going to be linearly. Everybody has one job, one house. Some people have two, some have none. But on the average, you expect a linear kind of behavior, and indeed you do. However, the surprising thing we discovered, and it was a big surprise, was when we came to think of, look at things that are intrinsically social and have no simple, if any, uh, relationship to the quantities in biology. Truly social. So you'll see what I mean in a minute. So <laughs> here's a couple. This is total wages. And this is, well, let's look at total wages. What you see is an exponent that is bigger than one. Not so, well, when you think about it, you know that. Bigger the city, the more you, you earn. Okay, per, Number of super creatives, like everybody in this room, there's a social class called super creatives. Bigger than one. But you notice this exponent very similar to this. Tax receipts. That's nothing in social sciences. 1.2. Patents. A lot of spread. 1.26. But you can see they're all clustering 1.15 to 1.2, 1.25. A lot of spread. And so on. And so what you find is that social, social organizations are more complex than biological ones because there are now, there isn't a simple universality, but there is a universality. And indeed, given the, given the constraints of the data, cities are, within a country at least, within a, an urban conglomerate, are indeed scaled versions. But they fall into this taxonomy. There is biological kind of behavior an exponent less than one, about 0.8, which means there's an economy of scale for those quantities. There's a trivial linear, but then there's this super linear, which has an increasing returns con connotation to it. And I like to think of as driven by innovation and wealth creation in some form. For want of better words, I'm not using the maybe technically correct, but uh, driven by that and are intrinsically social and something that did not exist prior to 10,000 years ago. It's new. And the question is, which of these drives cities? Which, of the, which is it that actually is operable here? So what we did was exactly repeat as in biology. Write down, OK, what comes in? Some goes to maintenance, and some goes to growth. So you can, the only difference here is we had before, we had this being last of the three quarters. Now we can have something that's less than one if it's driven by infrastructure, greater than one if it's driven by innovation, and so on. So here's the solution in general. You don't have to know it. And indeed, it falls into three categories. Here's less than one, just like biology, sigmoidal, grows, and asymptotes. A disaster for social systems, if you believe in our system, capitalism, growth. If you're not growing, you're dying, etc. So growth. If you demand that you're continually growing, 
as a social organization, this is terrible. This will not work, because you stop growing. Uh, I'll immediately skip to the superlinear, because the superlinear solves it, not surprisingly. You get unbounded growth. You can go on growing forever. This is what we see and what is intrinsic to our whole economy is this. This is great, fantastic, but it's a total disaster. It's a disaster because this, the equations have a finite time singularity, meaning that at some point, this thing goes to infinity. And that's terrible because obviously somewhere along the road here, you run out of, quote, resources. So what would happen, and you can solve the equations, it would stagnate and the system would collapse. That doesn't happen. Why? Why? It doesn't happen because, and the way to stop it happen is, you have to innovate. That is, a set of parameters, this equation, the solution to this equation depended on parameters that were set by whatever the social conditions were. You've invented, you, Bronze Age has come changed everything. And so it's a bunch of parameters are set. And then you start growing and you're running out or whatever, or you reinvent something, or you invent steam. You, re you change the initial conditions and parameters. So somewhere along here, you start again. You reset the clock and you start again. And that's the way you get around moving, uh, avoiding this singularity. But of course, you run up to it again. Somewhere along the line, you're going to have the same problem. So you have to do exactly the same thing over again. So you have what, it, what the theory then predicts is that you have this scalloped-like growth. You have to have a scallop-like growth, and ideally. And these, these, these times represent times of change, of innovation. This is what it predicts in terms of the, the, the number, the population versus time. That's also, that's great. So you can go on doing this, but there's a catch. There's a terrible catch. And that is the theory predicts that the time between these transitions necessarily gets shorter and shorter and shorter. And uh, so one other point, and that is that if you have superlinear behavior, which allows growth, so here's the, so let's go back. If you demand that you keep growing, you have to have a superlinear scaling, which is derivative from innovation and wealth creation. Okay, so that's the picture. So um, one of its consequences is that you can sustain growth, but you would run into a singularity. So you have to have cycles of innovation, but in, a, in an accelerated fashion. But there's another piece to it, and that is if you have superlinear behavior, and it is driven by a network, and the data suggests, since it falls into these taxonomic groups with similar exponents, so that crime is not unrelated to the production of patents, that is not unrelated to the number of creative people. All of these are somehow interconnected by some network, which we do not understand. We do not understand where these numbers come from. All we understand is if you, was, if you take the numbers and you put in the theory and you assume there is networks underlying it, you get this kind of picture. And you predict that the pace of life necessarily gets faster. Just as in biology, the metabolic rate went as mass to the 3 quarters, the metabolic rate per unit mass goes as mass of the minus one quarter, and all rates follow that, heart rates, evolutionary rates, etc. It's the exponent minus one, and if this is now, this exponent is greater than one, instead of having times, instead of having times that uh, decrease, uh, times that increase with size, as in biology, you now necessarily have times that decrease with size, so that rates speed up with size Life gets faster and faster, the bigger the city, and the, and the more you grow. And one of the most amusing pieces of this is the following, and I'm going to finish up with this, is that if you believe that there is a unifying underlying dynamical network somehow interrelating all of these, both information and energy,
then even things like the rate at which you walk is governed by this. And indeed, we found data on walking speed. And the prediction is actually, this is a bit small. We predict about 0.15. But nevertheless, it's got the right, it's the, I, I think the confidence limits just about cover what we predict. But I'm less concerned about it. But uh, there it is. And it's quite contrary to biology. In biology, it's that way around. That was heart rate. Okay, that's it. So, so I will finish there, and uh, um, I would just simply say that um, the work started out by trying to solve a limited set of problems, and sort of expanded as a sort of paradigm for thinking in terms of this coarse-grained way. And I think it sort of complements, and in no way supplants, the kind of and the the, the detailed kind of studies one needs to do. And what I feel very strongly about is, though, is that one needs to do many of those, the, the, the studies that we're all involved in, somehow in frameworks, not necessarily this one, but frameworks that have a bigger conceptual picture. And, and that's the way we can sort of bring together um, uh, people that, come, that are thinking about problems in a somewhat different way and actually get uh, new kinds of ways of thinking about some of these kinds of problems uh, because what shocked me when I first started thinking about this, no one in all of the work in urban geography and urban economics has ever plotted data this way. And it's hard to believe, frankly. And it's only hard to believe when you come from a physicist background where you plot it automatically um, and not from a social science view, viewpoint where you wouldn't, you know, there's no reason to plot it that way. There's absolutely no reason. And I think it's that kind of synergism um, I want to urge you to think about promoting. So I'll finish there. Thank you. Think forward. Think Research Channel.